Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Gods Themselves by Isaac Asimov. So as always, I'm going to check out the blurb, then I'm going to go through and look at some of my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, winner of the Hugo and Nebula Awards for Best Novel. In the year 2100, mankind on Earth, settlers in a lunar colony, and aliens from the Parry universe, a strange universe parallel in time to our own, are faced with a race against time to prevent total destruction of the Earth. The invention of the inter-universe electron pump has threatened the rate of hydrogen fusion in the sun, leading, inevitably, to the possibility of a vast explosion and the vaporization of the Earth exactly eight minutes later. Dun dun dun. So here we have the dedication to mankind and the hope that the war against folly may someday be won after all. Wow. Isaac Asimov's personality type, uh, MBTI type, is INTJ, and if you know anything about that kind of stuff, which by the way has been described as astrology for people with college degrees, so take it with a pinch of salt. But he is an archetypal INTJ, and so am I as it goes. So we have a character here, he says, It is a mistake to suppose that the public wants the environment protected or their lives saved, and that they will be grateful to any idealist who will fight for such ends. What the public wants is their own individual comfort. We know that well enough from our experience in the environmental crisis of the 20th century. Once it was well known that cigarettes increased the incidence of lung cancer, the obvious remedy was to stop smoking. But the desired remedy was a cigarette that did not encourage cancer. When it became clear that the internal combustion engine was polluting the atmosphere dangerously, the obvious remedy was to abandon such engines, and the desired remedy was to develop non-polluting engines. And basically they have this pump that it sort of pumps matter between the universe and the anti-universe, I guess, and um, it may be a bad thing, it may be about to cause the end of everything. But then you get like these conflicting interests of like, well the government, they want this source of power, you know? So they obviously don't want to fund research that suggests that it might kill us all. So uh, here we have, you have a good imagination, Professor, but I'm not buying it. I don't see any chance of giving up pumping on nothing more than your imagination. Do you know what the pump means to mankind? It's not just the free, clean and copious energy. Look beyond that. What it means is that mankind no longer has to work for a living. It means that for the first time in history, mankind can turn its collective brains to the more important problem of developing its true potential. And then I didn't tab anything out for a further 110 pages, which is half of the book. So that's how much I was enjoying this. It's not that it's bad, it's just not particularly good, I didn't think, by Asimov's standards. And here we get, so on the moon, obviously things are rationed, including water, and uh, so we get... You've had two showers here in the last week. I'll give you a water credit. I didn't know you were counting. I'm not counting, my water level is. She finished her own cup of coffee and stared at its emptiness thoughtfully. She said, they always make faces over it, the tourists do. And I can never figure out why either. It tastes fine to me. Did you ever taste earth coffee, Baron? No, he said briefly. I did, once. Some tourists had smuggled in packets of what he called instant coffee. He offered me some in exchange for you know what. Seemed to think it was an even trade. And you had some? I was curious. It was bitter and metallic. I hated it. And uh, the Lunarites, the children who are born on the moon, they can never go back to the Earth because they're accustomed to moon gravity, which is one-sixth of Earth gravity. Then we get this exchange here which shows a lot about like the societal mores. And who is Baron, your boyfriend? Celine laughed. Baron Neville. He's a lot more than a boy and a lot more than a friend. We have sex when we feel like it. Well, that's what I meant. Do you have children? One boy. He's ten. He spends most of his time in the boys' compound. To spare you the next question, he's not Baron's. I may have a child by Baron if we're still together when I'm assigned another child. If I'm assigned another child, I'm pretty sure I will be. We get, we get the Earthman saying, uh, I suppose if you ate a real steak, you'd probably gag at the fat and fibre. I know I would, but then I'm vegan, so. And then we get this interesting bit. I suppose that's the way. Still young enough to be adaptable. No emotional complications back on Earth. From the standpoint of the earthy male, I imagine it must be rather nice to have a sexual attachment with it. Sexual attachment? Celine's amusement seemed to cover a very real sense of shock. You don't suppose my father had sex with my mother? If my mother heard you say that, she'd set you right in a hurry. But artificial insemination was what it was for goodness sake. Sex with an earthman. The earthman looked solemn. I thought you said there was no discrimination. That's not discrimination, that's a matter of physical fact. An earthman can't handle the gravity field properly. However practiced he might be, under the stress of passion, he might revert. I wouldn't risk it. The clumsy fool might snap his arm or leg or worse, mine. Gene mixtures are one thing, sex is quite another. Someone says something soothingly, which, uh, you know, the road to hell is, is paved with adverbs. I thought this was interesting. Um, talk about this guy had a terrible night's sleep. 
How many times did you fall out of bed? Twice. I take it that the situation is a common one. For men of Earth, an invariable one. Awake, you can make yourself walk with due regard for the moon's gravity. Asleep, you toss as you would on Earth. But at least falling is not painful at low gravity. And I thought this was just interesting. They're talking about uh, this thing that they're using. A lunar lounge is its full name, she said, but we just call it a lounge. We take the adjective for granted here on this world. So this is all where they're all on the moon. And this is all the third part. And for me, that was the most interesting part of this book, this third section on the moon. <laughs> I thought this was a great line here. Now give me that thing. What kind of a lunarite will you make if you bring your earth puritanism here? You know that prudery is only the other side of prurience. The words are even on the same page in the dictionary. And then towards the end, uh, the lunar right asks the Earth man if he wants to have a baby because she's been given permission to have another one. And he's like, artificial insemination? And she's like, of course. So yeah, overall, The Gods Themselves by Isaac Asimov. I'd give this a fairly weak 3.5 out of 5. It was okay. It was nowhere near what I was expecting, unfortunately. The last third of it set in, on the moon. That was like really where I started to get absorbed by it. Um, there is like high stakes in terms that it's kind of about the end of the universe except I never really found myself caring too much. I've never been too fond of the universe. <laughs> but yeah, I will be reading more Isaac Asimov soon, so keep your eyes peeled. And as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.